It's been a, a long and wonderful journey through this book, and uh, we still have a little ways to go. Uh, it's been some time since we've found ourselves here. We've had a little bit of time off here and some, some other things going on. Uh, but if we can think back a little bit, uh, in the last message we talked about what I would say is the real heart of the message here, the book of Revelation. Uh, of course, the grand subject of the book of Revelation is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the grand subject of all of Scripture. But I think if we had to narrow this down to a real central message, the message here in the book of Revelation is, as Christians, we must live in the light of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And live life looking forward to all of the things that that entails and to our inheritance and all of the blessings that we will someday receive through our faith in Christ. And that is what it's all about. Uh, all through the book, we've seen the Lord presented in all of his glory, um, as well as what awaits those who trust in him. Uh, we've also seen very graphically presented what awaits those who refuse to believe um, and uh, refuse to repent and trust in Christ. Uh, the final resting place for those people, of course, being the lake of fire. Uh, in the last message, we had it very eloquently presented that each and every one of us must make a choice. And in this message here, we're going to see that point, I believe, reiterated once again. Uh, because ultimately, that's exactly what it is. It's an action of the will where we bring ourselves uh, by the power of the Holy Spirit to the point where we recognize our need and finally put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for our salvation. So with that, particularly since it's been a little while since we've been here, I'm going to go back and read uh, a large portion here of chapter 22. Uh, let's begin in, chap in verse 6, if you will, right in Revelation 22. Got my pulpit glasses right here. Looking at Revelation chapter 22, verse 6 and following, the word of God says, And he said to me, These words are faithful and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, sent his angel to show his bondservants the things which must soon take place. And behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who heeds the words of the prophecy of this book. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed me these things. But he said to me, do not do that. I am a fellow servant of yours and of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who heed the words of this book. Worship God. And he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Let the one who does wrong still do wrong, and the one who is filthy still be filthy. And let the one who is righteous still practice righteousness, and the one who is holy still keep himself holy. Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to render to every man according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes, so that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter by the gates into the city. Outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the immoral persons and the murderers and the idolaters and everyone who loves and practices lying. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things. For the churches, I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright and morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come, and let the one who hears say, come, and let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes to take the water of life without cost. I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues which are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the tree of life and from the holy city 
which are written in this book. He who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming quickly. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Amen. Let's open in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for these words. We thank you for this book, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Father, I ask that your spirit, the same spirit that inspired the writing of these words, that your spirit will be with us today, that you will open and prepare every heart that hears these words, and that you will have your way in each and every one of us. Uh, Father, uh, I just hold everyone listening up to you today. I ask you to remove uh, every inhibition that there is to the hearing of these words. And those with ears to hear, Father, I ask that you would open those ears and that people will hear the seriousness of these words that we have before us today. I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 <clears throat> so we're going to pick right up where we left off in the last message, and we're going to begin in verse 16. So in verse 16, clearly we have the Lord Jesus speaking here again. Uh, Jesus testifies that he has sent his angel to show John these things, to reveal them for the purpose of them being witnessed and documented by John. So yes, uh, these were ministered through an angel, through a messenger, uh, but ultimately its source is from God and from the Lord Jesus Christ. So what we have here is a message from God, and like all scripture, these are the words of God. Um, you may have noticed that in, it is my practice every time that I read from scripture in front of you to remind you and me that what we have before us are the words of God. Um, and that's how we need to treat them. We need to treat them with the very same reverence that we have for God himself which is going to be a primary focus of the message today. Uh, but Jesus is ultimately the source and the subject, for that matter, of the words that we have here before us today. Furthermore, Jesus makes another point regarding who he is. Uh, he states, I am the root of David and the offspring of David. So if we think about this for just a second, this is a very profound statement here regarding uh, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. As God, he is the root or the source of David, uh, and in fact, of all things. Uh, as God, he is the root and source of all things. But he is also, according to the flesh, a descendant of David. And this is a testimony right here before us of the dual nature of Christ. He is the God-man. He is God and he is man in one, the perfect mediator between God and man. Um, and so this is a very profound statement. We talked about earlier on uh, about Psalm 110. And in fact, Jesus himself used Psalm 110 uh, to question the Pharisees at one point he basically painted them into the corner where they had to really wrestle with who he was. And I just want to remind us, it seems to fit with this uh, so closely here. So Psalm 110.1 1 reads, The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. So Jesus had... Uh, in talking with the Pharisees, he had confronted them with this fact and said, hey, the Messiah is a descendant of David, then how come David, writing by the Spirit, calls him Lord? And of course, they can't really answer his question without really getting in at the crux of the matter. And the text tells us that they just didn't, didn't dare to ask him any more questions. Uh, not, not good to get into a battle of wits with the king of the universe, that's for sure. And you know what? Ultimately, Psalm 110 makes no sense in any place or in any time until we understand the very nature, or should I say the natures of the Lord Jesus Christ, because he is both God and man in one person. And that is the only way any of this makes any sense whatsoever. 
uh, here he is largely making the very same point. Uh, he is the root or the beginning of David, and he is also by the flesh his descendant. Furthermore, Jesus goes on to identify himself as the bright and morning star. The morning star is the brightest star. It's the one that continues to shine brightly uh, in the morning. Uh, it's very preeminent, which also tells us something uh, about Jesus himself. And it was also promised by Jesus uh, in his letters to the churches, in his letter to the church at Thyatira, in verse 26 of chapter 2, that the one who overcomes would receive the morning star. Reading verses 26 and following uh, from chapter 2 in Revelation, the one who overcomes and the one who keeps my deeds until the end, I will give him authority over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of the potter are shattered. As I also have received authority from my father, and I will give him the morning star. The one who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And so as we have seen so many times, we have a reference back to what is promised to those who ultimately overcome. And those who overcome, as we have said many, many times, are those who are believing and trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. All those who put their faith in Christ will overcome uh, and will receive an inheritance. Looking at verse 17, I'm just going to read this aloud once again just to refresh it in our minds. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let the one who hears say, Come, and let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes take the water of life without cost. And so in verse 17, we have what's essentially a double call here using very much the same terminology. Uh, the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. So it is the desire of the Holy Spirit and of the Bride of Christ, which of course, as we've talked about also, uh, is the Church. The Church is the Bride of Christ. It is the desire of both the Holy Spirit and the Bride that the Lord Jesus return, right? Is there anything that we want more than to see the Lord, of Jesus, the Lord Jesus appear? Uh, hopefully not. And if we think about this, if the members of the church are all indwelt by the Holy Spirit, of course we're going to want the same things that the Spirit wants ultimately. And we long for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, I don't mind admitting this, it seems like as I see things continue to spiral downward, uh, I long more so every single day. Uh, uh, I don't know about you, but I get tired of wrestling with my own sin. I get tired of being immersed in uh, all the sin that's around me. And I look forward to the day when the Lord returns and we see things uh, finally put in, a war in order and uh, things made right once again. And I'm very encouraged because I, I run into Christians all the time whose mind are on the very same things. Uh, we've talked about this many times. In every age, every believer uh, is called to live their life like the Lord Jesus could come back at any moment. Uh, and the church has been eagerly awaiting for almost 2,000 years now. And that's exactly what we're supposed to do. And that is the clear message of this book. We should be eagerly awaiting, one eye constantly looking up as we await the Lord's return every single day. And we don't know, we might not even make it through this message today before the Lord returns, who knows. But we should live our life and we should use that as the motivation behind everything that we do. Because ultimately, uh, we have the book right here. We know how everything ends and we know that Jesus is going to win. Um, so we should be looking forward to that. The other invitation here, the other bid to come is to the unbeliever. Having seen in a sense here the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ in this book put on display, having read about all of his glory and the glory that awaits us that he is going to share with his church, with his bride, and all of the inheritance, the wonderful inheritance that we have laid up for us in heaven. Uh, I think about the heavenly Jerusalem, how 
The holy city has been described and how wonderful and glorious that's going to be. We, can't, we have no idea. We can't even imagine how awesome that's going to be. So in light of all this, we are being called to come and wrestle to a decision. On top of that, we've been shown the wrath of God and of the Lamb. We have read about all of the plagues that are going to be rained down upon those who refuse to repent and believe. And ultimately, we have seen their, their final resting place, which is a horrible place called the Lake of Fire. And so collectively, having journeyed through the entire book of Revelation, this is that moment where the call is placed. And every person is called to come, to finally come to the Lord Jesus Christ and to put their trust in him and to be saved. So I just want to break this down just a little bit and digest this here very slowly, this invitation. So this invitation is for whom? This invitation is for the one who hears and who desires. Um, that's ultimately what's being put before us here. It's the one who ultimately desires for this decision uh, that is going to put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. They have to want to do it. Uh, as I said earlier, it's, it's an act of volition, an act of the will to decide to put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, that's the only criteria that is given, is wanting to. That's it. One simply has to see their need and to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And there is no greater need than any human being will ever have than their need for salvation. We've talked about it many, many times, um, but we can never hear the gospel too many times. Every human being is born a sinner, and as a sinner, we commit sin. And because of that, we fall short of God's perfectly righteous standard. And because of that, uh, when we arrive at the day of judgment, no matter how good we've managed to live by human standards, uh, we are not going to be judged by human standards. We are going to be judged by God's holy, perfect standard. And no exceptions will be made, trust me. Uh, his standard is perfection, and it is going to be perfection that is going to be required. Uh, so because we can't meet the standard, the Lord Jesus Christ came and became a man and took on human flesh. And he lived the perfect life that you and I could never live. And then he died a death that he didn't deserve on the cross to pay the penalty for our sin. And then amazingly, God pulls the ultimate switcheroo. Uh, one of my favorite verses in all of scripture, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Uh, he made him... Uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to look it up. He made him to be sin for us so that in him we could be made the righteousness of God. It's the ultimate trade. Jesus takes our sin upon himself and then God gives us credit for his perfect righteousness. And therefore, guess what? We meet the standard based on Christ's perfect life. So how does that get placed on our account? It gets placed on our account through faith. By simply believing that this is why Jesus came, that he came as the Son of God, left his place on high, and took on human flesh so that he could be our kinsman redeemer. If we simply trust in him, then we will receive the free gift of eternal life. And that is exactly what is being offered here. Uh, I like the way the good old King James translates this section here. It says, whosoever will. Whosoever will. It's open to anyone. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter where you live now. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what you're doing now. If you simply repent, turn from your sin, and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. It's that simple. Uh, it's a lot deeper than that. We can spend our entire lifetime studying the gospel and continuing to glory in its magnitude, its beauty, 
Uh, but it's sim so simple that we can teach it to a child. If you simply put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. And that's all it comes down to. <clears throat> this is the same call, really, the fulfillment of Jesus' statement in the Beatitudes. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. And that's from Matthew 5, 6. That's the picture that's being presented here. This only does us any good if we perceive our need. Uh, the picture that's being painted here is using the water of the river of life as the picture. All right? Anyone who thirsts, anybody who feels their need for that water of eternal life can come forward and freely accept the gift. Um, this puts it wide open. It's for everybody. And if we simply will feel our need, if the Holy Spirit has so convicted of us of our sin, of the fact that we fall short of God's righteous standard, and of the fact that we need that salvation, all we need do is simply place our trust in Christ, and it's done. We're saved, and we become children of God. I often think about the Philippian jailer in Acts 16. There are Paul and Silas, right? Uh, they've just been whipped and beaten beyond belief. They're thrown into prison. Their feet are put in the stocks. And what are they doing? Round about midnight, they're singing hymns and praising God. That jailer must have thought they were crazy. And then what happens? God literally shakes the place up, blows the doors wide open. And the jailer has finally seen enough. And he runs over and he says, what must I do to be saved? And what do they tell him? Do they give him a long theological treatise? No. They said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And it's literally that simple. That's from Acts 16.31, by the way, if you're interested. If you have already come to Christ, then you can join me in pondering the wonder of your salvation once again, all over again. But if there are any out there who have not yet put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you're still hanging on to the hope that you can somehow make it on your own, despair of that, follow the leading of the Holy Spirit, and put your trust in Jesus Christ today while it is still called today. Looking at verse 18. I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the tree of life and from the holy city, which are written in this book. So these are some pretty uh, heavy and sobering words here. And I can tell you this, there have been very, very few times that I have uh, preached any sermon and certainly any sermon from the book of Revelation where these words have not run through my head more than once. Uh, these are very, very sobering words, and we need to take them uh, very, very seriously. These are among the words that should give every teacher pause, and in fact, anyone who handles the word of God at all uh, a moment of pause uh, and it should fill every believer with a certain amount of reverential fear uh, because we need to be very, very careful what we do with the word of God. The immediate warning here contextually, of course, uh, specifically refers to anyone who would intentionally add or subtract from the book of Revelation. And in his, in his purpose of writing here, we have to understand that Revelation was written very closely to the end of the first century. The apostles were being martyred, and their time on earth was drawing to a close. Uh, the New Testament was uh, in the process of being written, including the book of Revelation. And the New Testament was approaching the time where the canon would be closed. And when I use the word canon, of course, I mean the books that would ultimately be included in the Bible and included in Scripture, the inspired writings that were given by God. So at the end of that time, that canon was coming to a close and things needed to be finally and firmly cemented. 
And so this warning here is to anyone who would add or subtract from this book. And in the years that would follow, particularly in the second and third centuries, we would see all of these false writings start to pop up, all of these false gospels and different things. And uh, the book of Revelation uh, includes in it the idea that, you know, you don't tamper with scripture. And this is not a new concept. This is a concept that appears over and over again throughout the Bible. <clears throat> Uh, I also wanted to mention here that if we look at the penalties that are described here, they're all the same penalties that await an unbeliever in the book of Revelation. Uh, there's two ways that we can take this, and I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. I'm not really sure what the best way to take them is. I am inclined to have the idea that anybody that would go to the lengths of trying to add or to subtract intentionally from the book of Revelation uh, probably ranks among the class of unbeliever, and therefore all of these things would have been true of them anyway. Uh, there's also the view that anybody that does that, uh, truly, as the text says, their name would be removed from the book of life and that they would be condemned. Uh, and if we look at, as I said, the punishments here, these are exactly the same things that await an unbeliever. As I said, though, I personally... Uh, slightly prefer the view of the former, um, but I don't think we can be 100% sure about that. By principle and extension, this extends to all of sacred scripture. It is all the word of God. It is all as binding and as authoritative as God speaking directly to us. Uh, he is speaking through people, as we've talked about many times, uh, though human beings moved the pen. It was the Spirit of God that was superintending every single word that is written so that what we have in Scripture is the perfect and pure Word of God that is free of error and it is absolutely binding on every person. <clears throat> uh, we need to treat God's Word, as I said earlier, with the same reverence that we would have for God himself. Uh, this warning that we have here before us is very similar to the warning that was given by Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 2. That says, You shall not add to the word which I am commanding you, nor take away from it, so that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I am commanding you. God repeats this warning once again in Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 32. So we can see how important this concept is. We see it over and over again in Scripture. Proverbs chapter 30, verses 5 and 6 say, Every word of God is pure. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his words, or he will rebuke you, and you will be proved a liar. Okay? And so this ultimately was the test of every prophet. Um, if people claim to be speaking from God, the test is, does what they say ultimately come to pass? Because if it doesn't, scripturally, it's proof that they weren't ever really speaking of the Lord. And uh, we see that as a warning in scripture as well. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 20 and following, But the prophet who speaks a word presumptuously in my name, a word which I have not commanded him to speak, or which he speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. And if you say in your heart, how will we recognize the word which the Lord has not spoken? When the prophet speaks in the name of the Lord and the thing does not happen or come true, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You are not to be afraid of him. And ultimately, as we just read here, the penalty was death. It was a very, very serious offense. And one, uh, as we have just read, doesn't just stop at losing this life, but it has consequences in the life to come, potentially as well. Deuteronomy chapter 13, verses 1 and 5. If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder comes true, of which he spoke to you, saying, let's follow other gods whom you have not known, and let's serve them, 
You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God is testing you to find out whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall follow the Lord your God and fear him. And you shall keep his commandments, listen to his voice, serve him and cling to him. There's that word again, Pastor Don. But that prophet of that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has spoken falsely against the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery to drive you from the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to walk. So you shall eliminate the evil from among you. And so false prophets would very often do this for their own gain or for their own popularity. They would profess to be speaking the word of God uh, when in fact God had never sent them and in fact they were telling lies. Uh, this is also uh, heavily spoken out against in scripture. For example, in Ezekiel chapter 13, verse 8 and following. Therefore, this is what the Lord God says. Because you have spoken deceit and have seen a lie, therefore, behold, I am against you, declares the Lord God. So my hand will be against the prophets who see false visions and utter lying divinations. They will have no place in the council of my people, nor will they be written down in the register of the house of Israel, nor will they enter the land of Israel, so that you may know that I am the Lord God. It is definitely because they have misled my people by saying peace when there is no peace. And when anyone builds a wall, behold, they plaster it over with whitewash. So tell those who plaster it over with whitewash that it will fall. And so ultimately, it's a lot easier to tell people what they want to hear, right? It's a lot easier for people to hear things that are nice to hear and things that they want to hear. And throughout the history of Israel, there was a problem with people constantly coming forward and saying, hey, everything's going to be great. There's nothing to worry about. And the picture that is drawn for us here is that of a wall. So we have a wall that's so dilapidated here that it's about to fall over. And yet these false prophets, the picture is they would come along and whitewash it and make it look great. When in reality, it's about to tip over and collapse. And so they are condemned for the fact that Instead of leading the people into righteousness, trying to give the bad news to people so they'll repent and get back on the right track, instead they're just telling people what they want to hear and, you know, then the people are not repenting and they're just going about their business. Well, I can tell you in today's world there is no shortage of those false prophets. And there's plenty of false gospels out there to be heard and you don't have to look very hard to find them. Uh, otherwise, this also uh, applies to any person that would step forth and claim to be speaking from God. We have to be very, very careful about this. I see people on the Internet all the time. They come forward and they say, hey, God told me to tell you. And I'll be honest with you, I kind of hold my breath a little bit uh, because I truly hope that they've actually heard a message from God. Because the second you come forward and you claim to be speaking for God, you better know what you're talking about. Uh, some of them, I never see them again. And I wonder if that's coincidental or it's just because I haven't come across them yet again. Um, but this is deathly serious, uh, this concept of uh, being very, very careful of speaking for God and of speaking uh, from God. Uh, Furthermore, we are to test the words of anybody that claims to be speaking for God. Uh, I always love uh, reading about the Bereans. Uh, in Acts chapter 17, uh, Paul uh, is preaching in Berea, and the, the Bereans, uh, it's said of them that they're very, very noble. Uh, this comes from Acts 17, verse 11. Now, these people were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. And so, just like everything else, our standard of measure is the word of God. How do we know if somebody's speaking the truth? We see how it measures up with the word of God. So, the Bereans were eager to hear Paul's message. They were excited to hear the gospel, but they weren't going to take any wooden nickels. They went to the scriptures and checked them, 
and made sure, yep, it's exactly like he says here. And I thought of Bailey Ann this morning because I've seen her do this more than once. When I tell her something, she goes and checks it out. So she's a smart girl. <clears throat> so I've said it a lot. What's the best way to spot a counterfeit is to be very, very familiar with the genuine, right? If you know what, an, what a real silver dollar looks like and you've spent a lot of time with one, you won't have any trouble spotting a fake one. The seriousness of, this also, seriousness of this also extends to teachers who will experience closer scrutiny um, in the judgment. And when I say in the judgment, I mean before the judgment of Christ, where the works of every believer, as we've talked about, uh, will come under scrutiny. James 3.1 says, Do not become teachers in large numbers, my brothers, since you know that we who are teachers will incur a stricter judgment. And anybody who teaches in any capacity needs to remember these words. Uh, as I said again, we need to have a great reverence for handling the word of God. Um, the reason why I think teachers will experience the greater scrutiny is not only do uh, the things that we teach and the way that we teach uh, affect the souls of other people, potentially have eternal consequences, but also we are without excuse because if I come forward and I stand before you and I claim to be a teacher, then ignorance cannot be pled on my part. Um, so I approach this the same way I approach everything else. I basically rely on the grace and the mercy of God. You have seen me more than once, many, many, many occasions, particularly in teaching through the book of Revelation, uh, give you what I call, call my disclaimer. I am never afraid to claim to you what I know that I can tell you with great assurance. The gospel, I can teach that with assurance. I can say, thus saith the Lord. Um, we've talked about the book of Revelation, the type of literature where this is. I have been much more conservative in what I'm willing to tell you when it comes to the book of Revelation. And in my opinion, that is the only responsible way that I can teach this book. And sometimes I've had to tell you, it might be like this. Some believers see it like this. Some people in history have uh, held this belief and others have held this belief. And I think that's the only responsible way that we can teach certain parts of this book. Uh, as I told you, there has never been a time when I have approached this book where I have not been thinking about these verses that were waiting at the end in approaching and handling this book. The reason, another reason for my reverential fear comes from Psalm 138 too. I will bow down towards your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your mercy and your truth. For you have made your word great according to all your name. And so God places his word at the level of his name. And names sometimes in our culture, I don't think, have quite the meaning that they did in ancient times. But in ancient times, names meant something. Because a name was in accordance, in accordance with the character of the person that the name belonged to. And that name was very, very closely related to who that person was. And of course, when it comes to God himself, scripture is full of names. Uh, I could literally stand up here and read for over half an hour just the names of God that we find in scripture. And every one of his names tell us something about him. Because of the nature of who God is, his name is inexplainably great. And he places his word at the level of his name. And so we need to be very, very careful how we approach his word. And because the word of God comes from God, it has the same character of God. It is true. It is utterly trustworthy. And we can lean on it with everything that we have. Uh, I have to tell you, in the world that we live in right now, I don't believe anything unless it's written on the pages of Holy Scripture. Because... We wouldn't even know which way is up hardly without this book. And we live in a culture right now 
where everything is called into question and you don't know who to believe from one day to the next. Well, this is our measure right here. Everything gets measured in accordance with scripture and this will tell you what is true and what is false. And I just want to put this invite out there one more time. The grand subject of this book ultimately is the Lord Jesus Christ and he is bidding each and every one of us come. If the Holy Spirit is tugging at you today, if you know that you're a sinner and that you need salvation and you have not yet taken that step of trusting in the Lord Jesus, I would ask you that you would do so today. And if you, if you need to talk to somebody, if you'd like to pray, uh, we, we are blessed here. We have four pastors in the house any given moment around here. We suffer from an embarrassment of riches here. It's a, it's a great situation to have. So come find one of us that you feel comfortable with and have that conversation with us, if you will. And with that, let's close in a, world of prayer, in a word of prayer. Father, I thank you for these words. Uh, I just pray, Father, that you've put it on every heart here, the heaviness and the seriousness of these words, uh, the importance of trusting in your word, of handling it uh, reverently, and of taking it seriously. And Lord, your word makes it very, very clear. On our own, we're in big trouble. We need your son worse than we need anything in this life. And Father, I just, I just pray that you will call those in need of repentance, that they would just simply turn from their sin and place their trust in you today. We ask all this in Jesus' name to your glory. Amen. Amen. Thank you, and I hope you all have a very blessed Sunday. Yeah. Oh, that's the way to do it.